let me check i don't know whether something is happening or not hi hello friends uh, welcome back to electrical machines revision class just let me let me know whether you you <coughs> whether you all can hear me or not am i audible i hope i am audible i hope you all can hear me so let us continue the revision class so till yesterday i have just uh, given the introduction for live sorry <laughs> for parallel operation so let us continue from there so what we did is i told we have completed so many things so i will just start from the topic where we left in the last class that is parallel operation so in transformer the next topic that we have to re revise is parallel operation you all please let me know what is the purpose of parallel operation just recollect it once parallel operation is strictly conducted in order to meet the demand day by day the demand is continuously increasing because population is increasing and uh, the electrical appliances also completely increasing earlier days we were using only fans lights but nowadays we are using air blower compressor fridge air conditioner mobile laptop televisions uh, electrical electric bike electric car there are so many applications came now no so because of the day by day demand increment what we uh, have to do is we have to meet that demand we should pass the we should generate the electrical energy and we should transmit that electrical energy and we should distribute the energy but the problem is in order to distribute the energy for an example in the year of 2000 if we all observe in your local uh, places itself you can observe you might be observed in each and every city randomly there are some 400 to 600 houses but in the year of 2020 22 now if you observe it be, almost it became double of it near 800 to 1000 houses came because population is continuously increasing and uh, the electricity demand also continuously increasing so what we have to do when the demand is continuously increasing we have to meet the demand that is what our work so the essential work is we should bring some transformer with the existing transformer instead of replacing them see we can't do like this in the year of 2000 if i am installing one transformer and in the year of 2010 suppose if the demand is increased to some other watts i cannot replace the existing existing transformer by the new one this is not the correct way of doing this because it is not economical i have to redesign the transformer again and again when the demand is continuously increasing i have to construct the very big transformer that should be better than the previous one and I, again i have to replace the older one by the new one can we go like that so if the day by day demand is increasing we cannot replace the existing transformer by the new one and continuously if you are doing like that it is not economic and it is not the convenient performance so what people started doing is people started conducting the connecting the parallel circuits it means for an example already one transformer is being existed along with that in parallel to this we are bringing one more transformer that transformer is simply connected in parallel with the existing transformer such that we know in parallel connection in parallel connection from the basics of circuit theory in parallel circuits some people are always remain same so with that condition people started conducting the parallel operation successfully so the biggest advantage of this one is existing transformer still it is there and we are bringing the incoming transformer just to uh, satisfy uh, just to meet the requirement of the additional demand so because of this what will happen there is no need of uh, replacing the existing one and it is economic and it is very easy to transport because we are going to manufacturing the transformer which has which are going to meet the uh, additional load that's all so that is the purpose of connect, uh, connecting the parallel operation now we are going to simply learn it that's all i hope now you all understood why we are bringing the new transformer with the existing transformer and the next thing is they are going to be connected in parallel see let us see when the moment you are connecting two transformers in parallel you please tell me let us take single phase transformer when i am trying to connect two single phase transformer in parallel the mandatory thing is the existing transformer rated voltage and the incoming transformer rated voltage must be same yes or no that is the condition number 1 so the rating of the existing transformer i am calling it as vr1 and the rated voltage of the incoming transformer should become same because they are going to be connected in parallel circuit in parallel circuit voltage remains same 
it should be remain same so that is the condition number one whereas the condition number two is for the existing transformer if this is the plus if this place is positive polarity and this place is negative polarity then in parallel circuits what should be keep the incoming transformer also should maintain the same polarity such that you can avoid the circulation current you all know otherwise circulation current will become it will be started some circulation current will be existing and it will be and it will be started circulating inside the transformer itself it will become and it will be unnecessarily generating some heat and it will be unnecessarily generating some losses so we should avoid this we should make the value of circulation current equal to zero it should happen only when the incoming transformer polarity and the existing transformer polarity are similar to each other such that they will not allow any current to circulate inside the transformer so in order to make the circulating current should be zero polarity of the existing transformer and the incoming transformer should be same polarity of the existing transformer voltage and the incoming transformer voltage should be same existing transformer voltage and the incoming transformer voltage should be same incoming transformer voltage should be same that is the two conditions for single phase operation when we are conducting parallel operation for three phase transformer few more things we have to learn first one as usual rated voltage of the existing transformer and the rated voltage of the incoming transformer should be same second one polarity of the existing transformer and the polarity of incoming transformer should be same the additional conditions are phase sequence of the existing transformer and the phase sequence of the incoming transformer should be same okay that is very very important suppose if the existing transformer is being operated in the sequence of abc you should not be bring some other transformer which is having the sequence of acb this is wrong so phase a phase b phase c this is the order in the same order you must bring the incoming transformer and the fourth mandatory condition is phase displacement on the secondary side should be zero the difference between the phase displacement of the existing transformer and the incoming transformer should be zero what do i mean it here the meaning of phase displacement is we know in case of three phase transformer we are having star delta delta star delta delta star star different types of connections if the transformer is descended with the help of delta star then we know between the primary voltage and the secondary voltage we will be having plus or minus 30 degree phase displacement under this situation if i am bringing some transformer in parallel to the existing transformer while measuring the phase angle displacement between the both secondary it should be zero if the existing transformer output suppose if it is offering 30 degree incoming transformer also should offer 30 degree such that if you are finding the difference between them that will become zero degree so the phase displacement difference between the both secondary terminal should become zero how it is possible sir that can be possible only when you are bringing see in order to make the phase displacement between the difference between the phase displacement between the both the secondary side of the transformer to zero if the existing transformer is descended in delta star incoming transformer should be star delta suppose if the existing transformer is star delta then the incoming transformer should be delta star this is most important uh, previous year exams questions uh, even in the upcoming exams also you can expect this type of questions often if the existing transformer is descended in delta star what will be the perfect matching for the incoming transformer incoming transformer should be star delta understood if the incoming transformer if the existing transformer is star delta then the incoming transformer should be delta star these are all the mandatory conditions to perform the parallel operation in case of single phase and three phase transformers i hope you all uh, understood what i am trying to mean it so don't miss it let us see the next thing is we have to identify the current flow see when two transformers are connected in parallel when two transformers are connected in parallel then what is the current supplied by the transformer a see for this let us go back to the circuit this is the transformer a and the transformer b current carried by the transformer a is ia current carried by the transformer b is ib since the rating of the both transformers are equal to each other so their potentials are equal and the polarity is also equal so i am just treating them as a single source that's all but the current rating is different impedance offered by them is different apparent power going to be delivered by them is also different everything is different except the voltage and its correspondent polarity okay sir let us carry on now i just wanted to know the current delivered by the transformer a out of the total load current what is the total amount of current delivered by the transformer 
similarly we have to identify the current delivered by the transformer b out of this total load current for that we can simply apply current division rule and you can write total load current and uh, since two transformers are connected in parallel so opposite branch impedance divided by total impedance similarly for the transformer b current this is the formula to calculate the total current supplied by the transformer a and the transformer b out of total load current similarly if you are requested to in the examination the most of the time the question repeated question is find the apparent power delivered by the transformer a find the contribution of transformer a out of the total load power find the contribution of uh, uh, transformer b out of the total load power this is the formula to calculate the kva rating that is kva supplied by the transformer a and the transformer b now if you take the ratio between kva ratings of transformer a and transformer b you can see the impedance are reciprocal to each other so the kva rating of the transformers and their corresponding impedances are always reciprocal to each other this is another uh, condition for uh, conducting the parallel operation if this condition is satisfied okay we will be happy if it is not satisfied if it is slightly different then it is okay it is adjustable still we can conduct the parallel operation because whatever the conditions that we have been understood so far they are called mandatory conditions the other conditions are uh, okay okay conditions if it is there okay if it is not there then also okay okay so this is all about parallel operation of transformer so let us enter into the next part that is called auto transformer now we were successfully conducted uh, we have completely revised a single phase transformer three phase transformer and its corresponding parameters equivalent circuits and uh, voltage equations voltage regulation maximum uh, zero condition sorry zero regulation condition maximum voltage regulation condition efficiency maximum efficiency and its corresponding conditions everything we were revised including three phase transformer if you are really uh, getting some information from our lecture don't forget to click that like button such that more people will get effectively utilized this content because i am putting much effort to uh, give the 100 percentage content such that you will be able to give almost 95 percentage of the questions out of 100 percentage that plus or minus 5 percentage is tolerance no i may be missed one or two concepts unknowingly so here i am putting my effort just uh, uh, to give my contribution in your examination so if you are really understanding or getting something from here just to put, click that like button and also try to share it with all your friends and also click that bell button because we are going to continuously conducting this live classes for the upcoming subjects i am not sure about it as of now but i am saying that in order to get the notification whenever we are trying to conduct some classes immediately it will be notified and you can utilize it effectively okay so just to click that like button for future updates so let us continue so when i am talking about the auto transformer in the examination point of view the most uh, most of the time the question is two winding transformer will be given and you will be requested to find out the kva rating of the auto transformer anyway i will come back to the auto transformer first uh, let us uh, design the auto transformer from two winding transformer let us take you all know two winding transformer is having two winding that's why it is named two winding transformer yes or no yes so let me design the two winding transformer and i will be explaining how to design for an example the primary voltage is given as v1 along with the, its polarity that is positive polarity and uh, its secondary voltage is given as v2 along with the, its polarity is dot we know in two winding transformer if the current entering point is highlighted by dot on the primary side then on the secondary side current leaving point should be dot because transformer is a negatively coupled device it means on one side at the dotted terminal current has to enter on the another side at the dotted terminal current has to leave first condition next uh, at, at the dotted terminal we are going to keep positive polarity such that on both sides i am just saying that polarity of the both windings are attracting each other there is no any opposition between them in order to clarify these two we are always keeping the dots these two points in two winding transformer from this two winding transformer suppose if you are designing the auto transformer what you have to do is first to find out the maximum amount of current that can be carried by the windings see there these are all called windings right now the rated voltage will be given on the primary side rated voltage also will be given on the uh, secondary side total apparent power will be given this rating is common for both primary and secondary side this is total apparent power what you have to do is you know apparent power is equal to v into i for three phase it will become root 3 times of vl into il but in general apparent power v is equal to s equal to v into i on the primary side it will be v1 into i1 calculate the current i1 from the with the help of apparent power and the voltage v1 similarly 
This apparent power can also be written as it is equal to V2 into I2. From this, try to explore the maximum current that can be carried by the winding. So that will be S divided by V2. Now from this, it is very easy for you to explore the maximum current that can be carried by the winding 1 and the maximum current that can be carried by the winding 2. Understood? That's all. Once you find these two, then you can easily design the auto transformer. Remember, what you have to do is two winding transformer will be given, data will be given, data for the two winding transformer will be given, primary voltage, secondary voltage, apparent power will be given. What you have to do is, with the help of apparent power, primary voltage and the secondary voltage, calculate the maximum winding current that can be carried by the both windings. After that, now you can design the auto transformer. Sir, how to design the auto transformer? Is there any uh, conditions? Yes. Let me tell you, first uh, draw the complete winding. Some of you might be new for this. First try to understand. I am just uh, connecting the total winding. While designing the auto transformer, what we are going to do is, the primary winding and uh, the secondary winding are going to be merged together. First condition is, primary and the secondary are going to be merged together. And the next one is, here we can observe that some portion, see there, let us take this voltage is called low voltage winding, this voltage is called low voltage winding and uh, this voltage portion is called high voltage winding. For an example, suppose if V1 is having low voltage and V2 terminal is having high voltage from the two winding transformer. From the data you can easily observe, no, it will be defined that uh, 100 voltage divided by 1000 voltage or 110 voltage divided by 1100 voltage like that they will be defining the low voltage and the high voltage winding values. From this you can easily identify which is having low voltage, which is having high voltage. While designing the auto transformer, see there, if you observe the portion that I am marking here, see there, this portion is common for both uh, secondary and of course the same portion is there on the primary also. Whereas if you observe the above portion, see there, this one, this portion is only connected with one side of the transformer, in the auto transformer. So what you have to do is, first step, this is the way you have to design the transformer. Like sir, how can I do that? What you have to do is, observe the winding voltages. From the two winding transformer, just observe the low voltage and the high voltage windings. After that, what you have to do is, high voltage winding will be placed separately. One second. See there. Sorry. Low voltage winding will be placed separately. You must keep low voltage winding separately to, to get the maximum KVA rating. High voltage winding will be the common terminal for both primary and secondary. That is the first step that you have to do. So low voltage means, uh, suppose I am taking, I am assuming that V1 is the low voltage, so V1 will appear here. And I also assumed that high voltage is V2. So V1 will appear on the top, V2 will be appear on the bottom. So V2, high voltage will be the common winding for both primary and secondary. Low voltage winding should be separate. Either it should be on the primary side or it should be on the secondary side, but it should not be common. Why I am giving this condition is, this is the observation. If you are connecting like that, it will be helping you to obtain the maximum KVA rating from the auto transformer. Because I am designing auto transformer from two winding transformer to obtain the maximum KVA rating, maximum efficiency with the same losses. So in order to achieve that, what do you have to do? We have to connect the low voltage winding separately and the high voltage winding between uh, commonly. After that, you should be taking care of the polarities. Very important. See there. Suppose if it is the terminal A and I am naming it as terminal B, this is terminal C and the terminal D. I hope you all can see that. Let me round it and show you what I did here. I am just uh, giving some name for the two ending transformer. After giving these names, what I have to do is, I told that V1 is the low voltage winding, V2 is the high voltage winding. So V1 will be placed on the top. So V1 is having two terminal, this is terminal A and uh, at the end, 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 so this terminal, I can call it as, this is terminal B for winding A. Along with this, we have to bring the additive polarity transformer, winding 1 should be in additive polarity with the uh, winding 2. So we are just uh, merging the high voltage winding of the two and uh, low voltage and high voltage winding, we are combining. So how we have to combine is, we should combine in such a way that primary voltage and the secondary voltage are going to be attract each other. Like, if, if it is plus on the top, if it is plus on the top and the bottom is minus, at the secondary winding also should be plus and minus. Okay? So it should be like this, such that that is called attractive polarity. So dot should be placed like this. Understood? 
so these are all the two strictly mandatory condition that you have to maintain when the moment you are trying to design the auto transformer from two winding transformer i hope you all understood what i am trying to mean it okay so let me place the dot here it should be dot such that what will happen see there i am putting minus here i am putting plus here i am putting minus here i am putting plus here so the low voltage winding and the high voltage winding are going to be attracting each other so the net voltage will be increased now if you observe the primary side of the auto transformer now you can observe the primary side of the auto transformer what will happen here now if you keep your attention with the primary side of the transformer the overall voltage has been increased see what is the overall voltage let me see this is secondary side the overall voltage on the primary side is v1 plus v2 all put together added that will become the total voltage on the primary side that is the primary voltage and here i am calling it as this is going to be your secondary voltage okay so after that what you can do is the next step immediately already i have requested you to calculate the winding currents do you remember yes just to substitute that values here see what i was telling is see this is on the primary side i was telling that low voltage winding that low voltage winding is carrying the current of i1 same current will be entering here this is the current i1 on the dot current is entering first conclusion now from here now the another thing is so from this dot current has to leave then that is the another conclusion anyway the thing is this is high voltage winding for this winding we have calculated the current is i2 already from the two winding transformer i have already explored the value of current i2 so it is very easy for you now see that these two windings are separated on one side see let me show you separately suppose let us take this is the primary winding and this is the secondary winding i am putting the dots like this now in this dot current is entering then at this dot current has to leave no so current should be in the upward direction so current should be in the upward direction such that this will be your i2 current and this current will become i1 so at the dotted terminal it will go out so the overall current that will be coming here is i1 plus i2 i can say like this because one side at the dotted terminal current has to enter whereas at the another side at the dotted terminal current has to leave such that you can obtain the total current on the secondary terminal that is your responsibility so in the same way what you can do is with the help of the primary and the secondary it is very easy for you now on the primary voltage and the total primary voltage this i1 if you multiply that will be the kva rating of the auto transformer similarly on the secondary side if you are multiplying the current with the secondary voltage that will also give you the same kva rating of the auto transformer either you can go ahead with the primary and the secondary choice is yours so this is the total power that will be transferred from primary side to secondary or secondary side to primary okay that's all that is enough i hope you all know this much already so further what i have to explain here is you know in transformer in auto transformer we'll be having uh, two types of power transfer one is called inductively transferred power and another one is called conductively transferred power now it is very easy for you to calculate the inductively transferred power and uh, conductively transferred power so i i have told you see inductively transferred power you can directly say this power is equal to two winding transformer power actually so from the transformer now inductively transferred power means this is the uh, common zone right C common zone means what i can say is sorry, separate zone or common zone you can take any one suppose this is the auto transformer this is the separate zone in this separate zone i just wanted to know the total voltage now this is the primary voltage and this is the secondary voltage of the auto transformer right all or else you can also know see that v1 into i1 we already know this v1 is the low voltage winding of the two winding transformer i1 is the current carried by the two winding transformer if you multiply these two directly you will be getting the uh, inductively transferred power or on the high voltage side also you can try with the help of v2 into i2 that will also will be giving you the value of inductively transferred power okay here i wrote this v1 v2 in terms of auto transformer you can directly take i1 into v1 v1 is the a low voltage winding of the uh, two winding transformer you can directly take i2 into v2 this is the low voltage high voltage winding of the two winding transformer this v1 indicates the auto transformer primary voltage auto transformer secondary voltage if we subtract these two that will also will give you the same answer only anyway you can go ahead with any one conclusion either you can go ahead with this conclusion or this conclusion anyway okay once you or i am simply saying whenever you are trying to calculate the inductively transferred power that power equal to kva rating of the two winding transformer do you remember kva rating of the two winding transformer i was saying that is yes it will be given kva rating of the two winding transformer will be equal to inductively transferred power of the auto transformer directly you can take that 
and the, now you know how to find out the total power of the auto transformer now conductively transferred will become total apparent power tra transferred by the auto transformer minus inductively transferred power with the help of this you can calculate the conductively transferred power in auto transformer okay fine let us go ahead in auto transformer we have the fixed turns ratio just for our calculation purpose we are utilizing it turns ratio is the ratio between low voltage winding of the auto transformer divided by high voltage winding value of the auto transformer by take after taking this ratio you can also directly calculate the inductively transferred upper and power and conductively transferred upper and power just by keeping this value of k so the inductively transferred upper and power will be equal to 1 minus k times of total kva rating of the auto transformer conductively transferred power equal to k times of total auto transformer kva rating and the most important question is copper weight you will be requested to identify the copper weight of the auto transformer when copper weight of the two winding transformer will be given what you have to do 1 minus k times of copper weighting weight of the two winding transformer will be equal to copper weight of the auto transformer you can simply put your answer whereas k equal to the ratio between low voltage winding of the auto transformer value divided by high voltage winding of the auto transformer understood so these are all the important things that you have to remember apart from that sometimes the voltage drop of the two winding transformer will be given and uh, you will be requested to find out the voltage drop of the auto transformer we are designing the auto transformer from two winding transformer the maximum voltage drop of the two winding transformer value will be given in the examination you will be requested to calculate the voltage drop of the auto transformer what you have to do is you know how to calculate the k now so design the auto transformer take the value of k from the auto transformer uh, voltages on the primary and the secondary side that is low voltage and high voltage side after that subtract the value of 1 minus k then multiply it with the voltage drop offered by the two winding transformer it will be given in percentage you will also getting the answer in percentage got it so this is how we are calculating that is how we are dealing with the auto transformer see for more pre classes this is my suggestions if you are really getting some informations from our lecture don't forget to click that like button the purpose of like button is uh, if you are getting some information then youtube will be commenting this lectures with so many people so that they will also get the benefit that's all okay and uh, subscription you can done and you can also click that like button to get the uh, more updates whenever i am trying to conduct some uh, live classes immediately you will get the notification on your uh, mobile itself directly and try to share it with all your friends because i need your support i am doing this just for your you, you people only some of you requested that uh, electrical machines we are very weak and we don't know uh, some something we may be missed so i have been seen that so many uh, messages on whatsapp and in comment section also so that's why i am conducting this revision class uh, in a effective manner so soon i will be uh, trying to complete the whole uh, part of the electrical machines for that i need your support so try to share it with all your friends okay fine so this is all about transformer completely we have completed the uh, transformer now so now we know what we know is uh, single phase transformer and it's all important parameters formulas concepts auto transformer three phase transformer everything we know so the next machine immediately we are going to start is induction machine so when we are talking about the induction machine induction machine has been classified into two types one is induction generator and uh, another one is induction motor in case of induction generator first of all in induction machine we will have two different speed one is called synchronous speed and another one is called rotor speed synchronous speed synchronous speed is talking about this is the speed of rotating magnetic field which is existing between the stator and the rotor of the induction machine so this is called rotating speed of the rotating magnetic field okay so this is ns now i am asking you what is the nr value rotor nr is nothing but rotor speed physical pole physical rotor so that it will be nr indicates the speed of the rotor so when we are talking about the induction generator rotor speed is always greater than the value of rotation of the magnetic field that is synchronous speed and the induction generator is helping us to convert the energy from mechanical to electrical similarly when we are talking about the induction motor in case of induction motor synchronous speed will become greater than the value of rotor speed it means the speed of the rotating magnetic field in the air gap between the stator and the rotor is greater than the value of the physical rotation of the rotor that is in case of induction motor of course in induction motor we are converting the electrical energy into mechanical energy after that let us take the principle of the uh, motor and let us continue from here you know induction machine is working under the principle of electromagnetic induction 
and uh, induction machine is consuming 30 to 50 percentage of the magnetizing current from the rated value in order to uh, set up the rated flux between the stator and the rotor. Do you remember when I was talking about the transformer also, I was saying that the magnetizing current is only 5 percentage of the rated current whereas in induction machine it is 30 to 50 percentage of the rated current. So transformer is consuming 30 to 50 percentage of the rated current to set up the rated magnetic field between the stator and the rotor air gap such that electromagnetic induction principle will be successfully working inside the induction machine and your machine will be successfully operated. Okay, fine sir. Next up, the other name is uh, induction machine is also called variable frequency machine. I will be bringing that concept, so I will be recapturing all those things. That is the alternative name for induction machine. And uh, induction machine, it is like a transformer, it is called a singly excited machine. When we are entering into DC machine or synchronous machine, we know in synchronous machine we saw there are two separate windings. One is armature winding, another one is field winding. Field winding is connected with the DC supply, armature winding is dealing with the, DC, uh, dealing with the AC supply. So basically we are having two separate excitation in synchronous machine. Of course in DC machine also we will be having two separate excitation. So one is armature winding, another one is field winding. Such a type of two separate field windings are not there in induction machine and transformer also. Transformer is a static device, induction machine is a dynamic device and both are having, that is both are being excited with a single supply only. So that is called a singly excited machine. And due to the difference between the rotor speed and the synchronous speed, see there is no matching between them. In case of generator, NR is greater than NS. In case of motor, NS is greater than NR. So the ultimate truth is, if I am trying to make them equal, then synchronous induction machine is failed to operate. We should not bring this condition here. If this condition is occurring, then that machine is called a synchronous machine. Since an induction machine, it is not at all being possible. If you are trying to do that, then machine is failed to run, it will stop. So either it will operate at this condition, then it is called a generator. If it is operated at this condition, then that is called a motor. So that's why this machine is also called synch asynchronous machine. Asynchronous means there is no synchronism between the rotor speed and the synchronous speed. They will never ever become equal in case of induction machine. Because of this reason, your induction machine is also called asynchronous machine. So the classification of induction machine based on the rotor structure. There are two types. One is squirrel cage induction ma machine motor and another one is slip ring wound rotor. Slip ring or wound rotor induction motor. Slip ring or wound rotor induction motor. I hope you all understood. Let us see. In case of squirrel cage on the rotor side, simply we will be having copper bars and they will be short circuited. Right? In case of slip ring, in case of slip ring, stator and the rotor structures are similar to each other. So the rotor also let me bring, let us see. First, if you are talking about slip ring induction motor, slip ring or it is also called wound rotor, just now uh, I have given that name, right? So when the moment I am talking about slip ring induction motor, the structure of the rotor and the structure of the stator are similar to each other and the rotor also designed in the same way of double layer distributed winding, it is similar to stator construction, okay? So in case of induction machine, the stator and the rotors are, in case of slip ring induction machine, stator and the rotor structures are similar to each other, both will be designed with the help of double layer distributed winding only. Understood? That is one type of classification. And second one is squirrel cage induction motor. So in case of squirrel cage induction motor, we will be using a big, big copper bars and they will be uh, oriented in the circle manner that is called the squirrel cage. They will be inclined at a particular angle and they all will be short circuited on both sides. That is called squirrel cage. If you are not getting the clear structure, you can just Google it, structure of squirrel cage induction motor. Then you will come to know how properly it will be uh, structured, okay? So this uh, rotor has been de designed with the help of silicon steel lamination in order to reduce the losses. And of course, when the moment I am talking about the uh, slip ring induction motor, how we are designing it, the number of poles on the stator, the number of poles on the stator periphery will become equal to number of poles on the rotor. When the moment I am talking about slip ring induction motor, the number of poles are same and uh, the phase sequence, uh, say if, if you are talking about stator, suppose if it is having three phases A, B, C, rotor also will be having three phases A, B, C. So the phase sequence number of phases in both the stator and the rotor are same 
and the number of poles on this tether number of poles on the rotor are same in case of slipping induction motor because as i told you that the structure of the stator and the rotors are almost similar to each other in case of slipping or wound rotor induction machine but various in case of squirrel cage the rotor is simply copper bars they are simply short circuited and is simply designed with the help of silicon steel lamination in this case i cannot directly say that the number of stator pole and the rotor poles will be equal but what is the condition the strictly mandatory condition is if you want to operate the rotating machines it may be a synchronous machine induction machine dc machine number of stator pole must be equal to number of rotor poles that is mandatory condition sir you are saying that this is a squirrel cage induction motor it's a simple copper bars so i am not putting any poles over there then how can i bring that condition here without bringing that condition your machine is failed to operate number of stator poles should strictly should be equal to number of rotor poles how can i bring that condition what will happen is in case of squirrel cage induction motor poles will be induced poles will be generated by nature when the moment you are trying to rotate the induction machine what will happen is there will be no any definite rotor poles i can't say that these many poles are fixed on the rotor when the moment i am talking about squirrel cage but on the stator if you are having 12 poles under the running condition same number of 12 poles will be induced or generated on the rotor side so the number of poles will be induced as like stator if the stator is having 10 poles then the same amount of poles will be induced on the rotor also so what is the conclusion in squirrel cage induction motor type there is no any definite number of poles whatever the number of poles that are there on the stator same number of poles will be generated or induced on the rotor during the running condition that's all that is the first conclusion similarly there is no definite number of phases as i told you that in slipping induction motor the number of phases are fixed whereas in squirrel cage induction motor there is no any definite number of phases but what i can say is alternatively we can define that the number of phases will always be on the rotor side the number of phases will be always equal to number of copper bars per pole on the rotor i told no in the rotor we are taking rotor copper bars so the number of copper bars per pole under per pole so with the help of the number of copper bars per pole you can say that the total number of copper bars per pole is always equal to number of phases in case of squirrel cage induction motor understood next let us define as i already told you that in case of induction machine we will be having two speeds one is called one is the speed of the magnetic field and another one is the speed of the rotor physical rotor these two people are never ever become equal so i just wanted to know the uh, exact difference at what fractional difference the machine is running that is simply called slip slip is giving the fractional value of the difference between the magnetic field and the rotor speed speed of the magnetic field and the rotor speed so that is simply called a slip and it will be defined as synchronous speed minus rotor speed divided by synchronous speed in percentage you can multiply it by 100 if you want to write down the slip in percentage you can multiply it by 100 and you can write down it is in percentage and from this above derivation if you are trying to bring the value of rotor speed then rotor speed nr will become ns into 1 minus s then at the same time under running condition see when the moment you are trying to start the induction motor that is called standstill condition when the moment you are trying to start the induction motor that condition is called standstill condition at the standstill condition at the time of starting the value of rotor speed will be zero when the moment immediately you are start trying to start the induction motor what will happen is synchronous speed is the speed of the magnetic field it's a magnetic field it won't have moment of magnetic inertia see the magnetic inertia is very very less so when the moment you are giving the supply immediately within fraction of nanosecond synchronous speed will be builded between the stator and the rotor magnetic field will be started rotating at a synchronous speed so i don't want to talk about the amount of time taken by the induction machine to build the magnetic field because it won't take much time within very very fraction of nanosecond synchronous speed will be built up between the stator and the rotor air gap but rotor is a physical uh, structure it will take some time slowly by following the operation of induction machine it will be started rotating 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 then it will reach the steady state condition so the conclusion is here under standstill condition the value of rotor speed is immediately zero but synchronous speed when the moment i am trying to switch on the induction machine at this instant i can say the value of rotor speed is zero when the moment during the time of starting that is called standstill position 
but during the switch on second within very fraction of second synchronous field will be developed so what will happen is nr will be zero but ns will be immediately build up so the value of slip will become one at the time of standstill when the slip will become equal then i can say induced frequency on the rotor and induced frequency on the stator will become equal to each other so i can say rotor frequency and the stator frequency are both equal to each other when the moment you are trying to switch on the induction machine but under running condition rotor frequency will become slip times of supply frequency or radar frequency of the induction machine understood let us see some observations we saw there are two types of induction machine right one is squirrel cage and another one is slip ring slip ring or wound slip ring or wound so when i am comparing the power factor the power factor offered by the squirrel cage induction motor is always higher than the value of power factor offered by the slip ring or wound wound rotor induction motor efficiency of the squirrel cage induction motor is always greater than the value of efficiency of the wound motor similarly if when i am comparing the squirrel cage induction motor with the slip ring induction motor designing is very cheaper and uh, maintenance wise squirrel cage induction motor is demanding very less maintenance when i am comparing it with a slip ring or wound rotor induction machine understood this all the sum of the difference between these two people now let us see the production of rotating magnetic field as i already told you that there are two people who will going to rotate inside the machine one is rotating magnetic field another one is rotor so the production of rotating magnetic field how it is possible i am talking about induction motor it is in our syllabus not induction generator so whatever the things that i am concluding they all are for induction motor only so in the induction motor first you have to inject the three phase supply on the stator side when the moment you are injecting the three phase balanced supply on the stator side immediately it will be passing the three phase balanced supply current this three phase balanced supply current will be generating the three phase balanced resultant mmf that is the rotating magnetic field between the stator and the rotor and uh, if you are observing the individual value of the resultant uh, mmf that will become 3 by 2 times of actual magnetic field mmf so this is the resultant mmf magnitude that will be 3 by 2 times of actual maximum mmf that is fm denotes the mmf of the field rotating magnetic field this is under the running condition resultant individual resultant mmf will become 3 by 2 times of yeah, maximum that is mmf so this resultant mmf is called simply magnetic field this will started rotating at a speed of ns that is called synchronous speed basically this synchronous speed will be uh, explored with the help of 120 f by p that is the formula so what i can say is this this speed is simply called this field is simply called rotating magnetic field and uh, this can also be represented as this resultant mmf can also be written as fm into cosine of omega t minus theta fine sir some of the observations before uh, doing this observation i will give some conclusions that will be very easy see there we know there are two parts in our induction machine one is stator another one is rotor rotor will rotate yes or no when the moment we are giving the supply definitely rotor will rotate but stator will be stationary so what is the rotational speed of the stator under steady state i am giving this conditions under steady state our system will be operating at a normal speed it is in steady state let us take the rotor is running at 1000 rpm what is the speed of a stator stator will be 0 rpm it will not run it will not rotate stator is a fixed static part it is called stator because it is static rotor is called rotor because it is rotating and between the stator and the rotor we are also observing that one rotating magnetic field you cannot see that but rotating magnetic will be there so that rotating magnetic field will rotate at a synchronous speed in case of induction motor that value is always higher than the value of what synchronous speed rotor speed when you are comparing the rotor speed with the synchronous speed synchronous speed of the induction motor is always higher than the value of the rotor speed of the induction motor so what are the components that we are having here is totally four people one is stator speed that is 0 rpm rotor speed that is nr rpm nr equal to ns into 1 minus s stator field see there are two types of rotating magnetic field that will be developed between the stator and the rotor that is called rotating magnetic field one is from the stator side one rotating magnetic field will be developed from the rotor side one rotating magnetic field will be developed they both will be just synchronized together and sing simply they will be running at a single speed that is called a synchronous speed so the rotating field developed by the stator and the rotating field developed by the rotor both will run at a same speed that is called synchronous speed 
so all put together between the stator and the rotor we have a single speed that is called a synchronous speed that is the speed of the rotating magnetic field okay now stator speed is zero rotor speed is nr stator magnetic field is ns rotor magnetic field is ns with the help of these three let us explore some parameter that are being often asked in your examination step number one first what they will ask is see just observe this statement speed of the rotor rotor will rotate at the nr speed of the rotor field with sorry rotor field not uh, nr sorry forgive me that's why we have to read this statement fully huh? speed of the rotor field rotor field means rotor magnetic field that will rotate at a synchronous speed with respect to rotor rotor will rotor will rotate at the nr so the question is speed of the rotor field is ns with respect to means you have to find the difference with respect to nr is ns minus nr we all know ns minus nr can be written as s into ns because slip s equal to ns minus nr by ns from this i can say if you are bringing this ns to the left hand side s into ns will become equal to ns minus nr let us take one more one speed of the rotor field once again ns with respect to stator stator speed is zero so difference is ns minus zero or we can call it as ns similarly speed of the stator field stator field ns with respect to rotor rotor is nr so what i can say sorry uh, what they did is rotor field not rotor i have to read the question properly forgive me speed of the stator field is ns with respect to rotor field that is also ns so ns minus ns will be equal to zero so like that if they are asking some other things if they are asking uh, speed of the stator speed of the uh, what i can say let us say speed of the stator field with respect to stator what will you say stator field is n s minus stator speed is 0 rpm stator field speed is different stator speed is different stator will not rotate but the magnetic field developed by the stator is called st uh, stator field magnetic field developed by the rotor is called rotor field so whenever you are observing the term is called field they are talking about the rotating magnetic field between the stator and the rotor gap just to do remember this it will be very useful for you all when you are trying to solve the problems in your examination okay fine sir so let us uh, continue with this next uh, we are going to conduct the steady state analysis okay steady state analysis in steady state analysis we just uh, wanted to explore the total amount of induced voltage on the stator and the rotor see we already know i told you that when i was discussing about the synchronous machine the construction of the stator of the synchronous machine and the construction of the uh, stator of the induction machine are identical to each other so whatever the induced emf formula that we were already observed in the synchronous machine we can bring the same formula and you can apply it here here we are talking about there are two part one is stator another one is rotor now let us talk about the induced emf on the stator side on the stator side we have winding yes so the induced emf e is equal to same formula 4.44 pi max into number of turns on the stator winding divided by supply sorry into frequency supply frequency f1 into winding factor of the stator you all know this winding factor can be further written as pitch factor into distribution factor understood that's all this is the formula to calculate the induced emf under running condition or to stand still any time this is the formula but when we are talking about the rotor the case will be different see stator is a static part it will not going to rotate at any cost so under running condition or not running putting the load not putting the load it doesn't matter for me whenever you are giving the supply on the stator side one and only formula is to calculate the induced emf is this one but on the rotor side the induced emf will be different same formula 4.44 into my maximum flux into number of turns on the secondary side frequency into winding factor so same formula you can use to calculate the induced emf on the rotor winding but here the problem is the frequency f2 can be written as s times of that is rotor frequency equal to slip times of uh, stator frequency we saw already yes just you have to apply this under standstill condition like when the moment you are trying to start the induction machine that the value of slip is 1 we saw that so you can put the value of slip equal to 1 and f2 f1 both are equal you can calculate the induced emf on the rotor same formula suppose if you are running the machine when the machine is running at a rated speed then the rotor frequency will become s times of stator frequency you have to replace the f2 by s times of 
F1. That is the formula to calculate the induced EMF on the rotor side. Let us see the equivalent circuit, rotor equivalent circuit. See there, this is the rotor equivalent circuit referred to the rotor side. Total resistance offered by the rotor, total reactance offered by the rotor in terms of slip. Under running condition, it will become in terms of slip and this is also will become in terms of slip under running condition only. Okay. So, under running condition slip will exist under starting at the time of starting the value of slip will become 1. So, do not forget that standstill means starting condition slip will be 1. Running condition means slip will appear such that the equivalent circuit can be written as the rotor induced voltage is S times of E2 and the rotor resistance is R2 and this will be S into X2. This circuit can also be alternatively drawn just for the analysis purpose. Later I will show you first this is the standard approximate rotor equivalent circuit. From this, if you are calculating the rotor current magnitude, total supply voltage divided by total impedance that will be square root of R2 square into R2 square plus S times of X2 whole square. Now from this, if you are taking the slip outside, see uh, on the stator side slip is there, on the rotor side if you take slip outside then the equation can be expressed like this. If you are requested to calculate the rotor current at a standstill condition as is shown, replace slip by 1 and calculate the value of rotor current, that is all. After that. Let us calculate the formula to calculate the power factor on the rotor side. Power factor formula cos pi is equal to resistance divided by impedance. So, resistance L is R2 divided by square root of R2 square plus S times of X2 square. At a standstill, once again, if you are requested to calculate the power factor offered by the rotor at a standstill, then replace slip equal to 1, then cos pi 2 will become R2 by square root of R2 square plus S times of, sorry, S will become 1, X2 whole square. So, this is the generalized formula to calculate the power factor of the rotor. Next, let us see the alternative representation. See, the same circuit can be redrawn like this. The reason is, the load is continuously varying, mechanical load. I am talking about induction motor. We are putting different, different load. The load is not fixed, it is not constant. So, that variable load also giving some changes in the contribution. It is giving, uh, what will happen? When the load is changes, automatically load current will change, load torque will be changing, power delivered by the induction motor is changing. So, all the parameters are immediately getting affected when the moment we are observing the mechanical variations on the load side. Since I am talking about the induction motor, the output power of the induction motor is mechanical power. So, the mechanical power is continuously varying time to time. That mechanical power variation, the mechanical load variation can be electrically represented in terms of our circuit. So, this is the alternative convenient representation of the electrical equivalent circuit of the induction motor just for the purpose of analysis, easy way of analysis. Understood? So, this is the equivalent circuit, just you can note it down. After that, let us see the stator power C, whatever the formula that I am giving, all are for purpose, but we are talking about three phase induction motor. You know, uh, I am talking about per phase quantities. For three phase, you have to multiply the answer by three, that is all. So, I am writing all the quantities in terms of purpose. The stator power, supply voltage, stator voltage, stator current into stator power factor will be giving stator power. That power is entering into the induction motor. After that, what will happen? On the stator side, you will observe there are some losses. Of course, we can copy, call it as a stator core loss and a stator copper loss. So, stator core loss and a stator copper loss. Some losses you can observe on the stator side. By subtracting this, you can enter into the air gap then you will be requested to calculate the air gap power. Air gap power is also called rotor power, right? It is also called gap power PG. It is also mentioned as air gap power. That will be equal to rotor current I2 square into R2 by S. Sometimes in the examination, they will be giving I2 dash R2 dash. It means equivalent amount of current. Secondary current will be shifted to primary. Secondary resistance will be shifted to primary. Primary means stata in induction machine. So, the secondary current, rotor current referred to stata. Rotor resistance referred to stata. So, directly you can substitute that values divided by slip will give you the air gap power. The alternative, uh, alternative, alternative procedure is if you know the amount of air gap voltage and uh, amount of voltage that is entering into the air gap and the amount of current that is entering into the air gap into cos pi 2 that will be also giving you the value of air gap power alternative formula. So, immediately what we are doing after that see I am just starting I am just going in the flow. First I have started at uh, stator power. Then from the stator power, we have to subtract the stator losses, that is stator core loss and stator copper loss. After that, you will be getting air gap power. From the air gap power, what will happen is next uh, you have to face the air gap loss. Sorry, from the air gap power, next one is rotor copper loss. The formula is I square uh, 2 into I2 square into R2. Remember, I am talking about single phase. 
for three phase you should multiply it by three okay i am talking about per phase parameters so the rotor copper loss is i2 square into r2 from the air gap power you have to subtract this then you will be getting the grass mechanical power developed across the rotor the formula is i2 square into r2 into 1 by s minus 1 now from this grass mechanical power if you are subtracting the mechanical losses that is friction and the windage losses if you are subtracting these two losses then you will be getting mechanical power that is the total output power total output power available at the shaft so the conclusion is this is the power flow diagram we are starting at the stator power then we are neglecting all the stator losses that is stator core loss and stator copper loss at all then we are entering into the air gap power from the air gap power we are facing the rotor copper loss after subtracting the rotor copper loss, we will be entering into the mechanical domain. In the mechanical domain, we have two losses, friction and windage losses. By subtracting this, we will be entering into the final point that is called what? That is the final power, that is shaft power available at the output, final output power, we can call it as. This is power flow diagram of the induction motor. Fine, sir. Now, see there, we saw that, uh, let me show here, sir. Air gap power formula we saw, rotor copper loss formula we saw mechanical power formula we saw if you are taking the ratio between these three people i square r2 is common everywhere they get cancelled out remaining people will be appearing 1 by s is to 1 is to uh, 1 by s minus 1 from this you can also if you are taking the lcm you can also write this re-expression uh, re expression as 1 is to s into 1 minus s so this is one of the previous year question i think it is asked in the ies exam just to remember the relations whatever that i am delivering here i hope you all try to uh, I write you all got it what I am trying to deliver. So after completing all these things observations see there the formula what we saw is air gap power formula is I2 square into R2 by S copper loss formula is I2 square into R2 if I am multiplying air gaps uh, air gap power by S on both sides S S will get cancelled. So this will become equal to copper loss and this will be equal to S times of PG. So, what I can say is copper loss equal to S times of Pg. Understood? That's all. So, what I did is, so I was just bringing the relations. So, here the value of uh, S, I am just multiplying on both sides. SS will get cancelled. I square R is nothing but copper loss. So, what I can say is copper loss equal to S times of Pg. In the same fashion, you can say mechanical power is equal to 1 minus S times of air gap power, that is Pg. Understood? Yes. Next, uh, we are going to look at look into the approximate torque equation. So, what we will do is, we will just wind up the session with this. Okay, I am just leaving the session with the approximate torque equation. Just to note it down uh, with this. Uh, in the next session, we will be starting from the approximate torque equation and we will be deriving what is the condition for maximum equ maximum uh, torque equation and full load torque equation, starting torque equation and how to calculate the slip at the starting and uh, at the maximum slip. So everything we are going to calculate step, we are going to observe step by step. So at, as I already promised that at the end of the electrical machine session, I will be bringing the lots of tricks and methods how to solve the questions and I will be giving the ideas how to crack the uh, questions okay, in the examination, how smartly you have to work in electrical machines in order to crack the all questions. So this is